Hello, my name is Catherine Forsyth and I'm a registered dietitian with the Grey Bruce Health Unit. Today I'm going to provide an overview to using the Menu Planning and Supportive Nutrition Environment Practical Guide. The video takes about 20 minutes, so sit back, enjoy, and I hope you learn some things that can help you to improve the menu planning and nutrition environment in your center. Welcome to the training video on how to use the Menu Planning and Supportive Nutrition Environment Practical Guide. The guide is broken down into seven sections, and we will touch on each one of them briefly in this training video. The best way to get familiar with the guide is to use it. Focus on one section at a time so it's not overwhelming. Refer to the guide to troubleshoot areas you and your staff may be struggling with, and if you can't find your answer there, contact your local health unit for further assistance. The Ministry of Education requested this guide from ODPH, Ontario Dietitians in Public Health, to help child care providers meet the food and beverage provision requirements of the Child Care and Early Years Act. Those requirements are based on the previous food guide that had four food groups, and the Ministry is in favour of continuing use of this practical guide for the time being. The first step to menu planning is becoming familiar and confident in one's knowledge about Canada's food guide and what foods fit into which food group. It is worth noting that the recommendations of the current version of Canada's food guide with three food groups are important to start thinking about while using this menu planning practical guide based on the previous version with four food groups. Centres can start thinking about moving toward a more plant-based menu, which has been shown to help reduce food costs. Protein foods are needed to build, repair, and maintain lean muscle mass. Animal sources of protein include beef, chicken, pork, turkey, fish, and eggs. The new version of the food guide recommends including more plant-based proteins, such as dried peas and beans, lentils and legumes, nuts and seeds, and tofu. By using these kinds of foods, childcare centers can continue to provide excellent sources of protein on their menus in a cost-effective manner. Only one-third of Canadians currently consume plant-based proteins like legumes on a regular basis. Legumes are dried peas or beans such as kidney beans, lima beans, black beans and chickpeas, and they are all excellent sources of fibre. Try using some of the recipes with more of these plant-based proteins from the Paint Your Plate Toolkit for child care providers. Water is promoted as the drink of choice in order to reduce the use of juice, flavored and sweetened milks, and other sugary beverages. Some staff may question why you can't serve 100% juice. The reason is that juice is a fruit vegetable choice and it's always better to eat a solid piece of fruit or vegetable rather than simply drink the juice because you will get far more fiber out of the solid version, even if your juice contains pulp. Water should be available to drink at all times, including between meal and snack times. So where did milk go? Milk and alternatives are included in the protein foods group on the new food guide. Milk remains a very important source of calcium, vitamin D, fat, and calories for appropriate growth and development. Plant-based beverages such as soy, rice, pea, almond and coconut are not recommended for anyone under two years of age. These plant-based beverages often lack adequate protein and fat, calcium and vitamin D. Infants require breast milk or infant formula for appropriate growth and development. At about nine to 12 months, whole cow's milk may be introduced. After two years of age, children may still be consuming human milk as expressed breast milk and they can be offered skim, 1% or 2% cow's milk, or unflavored fortified soy beverage. Children need a good variety of vegetables and fruit for vitamins and minerals, fiber, and energy. Only one in three Canadians consumes adequate amounts from this food group daily. Consuming vegetable and fruit regularly can help to reduce the risk of chronic disease and assist with maintaining good mental health. Vegetables and fruit provide an excellent source of fiber, the lack of which is being linked to an increased risk of depression, especially in North America where we consume so much ultra-processed food. 
The previous version of the food guide recommended making at least half your grain choices whole grain. The current guide now recommends making all of your choices whole grain. Centers can start moving toward this goal, weaning off white breads, pasta, and rice toward more nutritious and higher fiber versions of these products. Fiber has many helpful properties. It fills you up, helps to reduce cholesterol levels, helps to reduce blood sugar levels, and helps your bowels to move regularly. And since whole grains are an excellent source of fiber, we need to eat more of them. You can see how the new food guide principles can begin to be applied while still using the previous food guide for menu planning and assessment purposes. Centers may have children with food allergy and sensitivity issues. Food Allergy Canada is an excellent resource on this topic and how to reduce risks to children in your center. They have fact sheets and a free online course for the childcare setting. This course can help staff to increase their confidence when dealing with children with allergies in their care. Section two includes menu planning. Why take the time to plan menus? Well, here are six excellent reasons. It improves organizational time for planning, purchasing, and preparing meals. It improves the management of food costs and staying within a budget. It increases the variety of foods for children to experience. It promotes cultural inclusion, food group balance, and nutrient provision. It reduces food waste and saves money and it will improve your adherence to the nutrition requirements of the Child Care and Early Years Act. With the rising cost of food, a center wants to ensure every dollar spent is going toward nutritious foods that will assist in the growth and development of children and their enjoyment at meal and snack time. Most centers use a four to six week menu cycle. Use the chart on page 7 to see what your center needs to provide based on how long a child is in your care for the day. Most children will be there for 6 to 9 hours, so that means one meal and two snacks must be provided. The meal pattern can be found on page 8. It includes two choices from the vegetable and fruit group, and then one choice from each of the remaining groups, the grains, the milks, and the meat. In other words, you should see all four food groups at a mealtime. The snack pattern can be found on page 9 of the guide. Each snack must have two different food groups included. The morning snack can have one choice from the vegetable and fruit group and one from the milk and alternatives as a minimum. You can add more choices. For example, a yogurt parfait with frozen berries would meet the requirement but you could also add mini oatmeal pancakes to dip into the yogurt parfait. This would be adding a whole grain choice. The afternoon snack should include at least one choice from the vegetable and fruit group and one from the grain products. An example would be whole grain pita triangles with raw veggies, and you could add hummus, a protein choice for dipping. Page 10 in the practical guide reviews what should be considered when planning your menu choices. Try to include at least one dark orange and one dark green vegetable or fruit each day. Include cultural and traditional meal and snack options. Choose whole wheat or whole grain options. And lean meats and plant-based sources of protein such as beans, lentils, and tofu more often. Offer food prepared with little or no added fat, sugar, and salt. Skim 1% or 2% milk or unsweetened soy-based plant beverages for those two years of age and older. And make sure there's water available at all times. Section 3 of the guide includes food and beverage choices. Use the tables starting on page 12 to see what your center should serve most often from each food group. Then check page 14 to see that you are not serving sometimes foods more than three times per week. Sometimes foods have higher fat, sugar, or salt content and do not add to the growth and development of children like the serve most often foods do. The do not serve table starts on page 15. 
These foods contain few or no essential nutrients, are highly processed, or contain too much fat, sugar, or salt, or they could be choking hazards. Avoid serving these foods and beverages. Page 18 in the practical guide talks about dips, sauces, and condiments. These don't count as a food group choice either, but can be used in limited amounts. An appropriate serving size of these types of foods would range from one teaspoon to one tablespoon at a meal or snack. Section four of the practical guide is all about portion sizes. Portions are discussed starting on page 19. Even though the current version of the food guide does not use portion sizes, they are still helpful for efficient meal prep, planning, and budgeting. The previous food guide had portion sizes for Canadians age 2 and up. So, for children under 2 years of age, the estimated portion is only a quarter to one half of a full serving. For ages 2 to 5 years, it's a half to one full serving. And for ages 6 to 12 and older, it's one full food guide serving. Page 21 in the practical guide provides an example of estimating how much to prepare using specific ages and portion sizes. The more experienced your staff get, the less they will need to work this out for each meal. This experience and growing confidence will make serving sizes more consistent and help to control food costs. Have your cook or chef keep written records and notes on recipes. These will help anyone else stepping in to cover for them. You can use the tables as a guide for how much to prepare and serve, but you may have to adjust these amounts based on the individual experience at your centre. Check out page 23 of the practical guide for an easy example using whole wheat bread. It explains how you would estimate based on the age of the children and the number of children in your care. The total comes out to about 19 slices or about one loaf of bread. This again will help with purchasing and planning of meals. Page 24 in the practical guide mentions the self-assessment tool, which should be completed annually and after any major menu changes. This tool and its checklists will help you to monitor whether you are following the food guide recommendations, the Child Care and Early Years Act requirements, and creating a supportive food environment in your centre. Use the menu and snack pattern checklists and answer the questions about your menu and the food environment as accurately as you can. The centre supervisor should include the cook or chef and frontline ECE staff when completing this tool. If you're not familiar with the self-assessment tool, please see the instructional video on your county's online learning platform or contact your local health unit. Section 5 in the Practical Guide talks about mixed dishes. Mixed dishes can be broken down into their food group components to see that all groups are included at a meal. See the example on page 25 for lasagna. Tomato sauce and spinach fits into the vegetable and fruit group. Pasta is the grain product. The cheese fits under milk and alternatives. And lean ground beef fits under the meat and alternatives. This is a good place to remind everyone that this guide was released in 2017 and some links or resources are no longer available such as the eattracker.ca recipe analyzer. There are other free analyzers out there but it is not necessary to analyze your menu every time a change occurs. If you are providing a good variety from all the food groups and using the self-assessment tool checklists for continuous quality improvement, then you are likely meeting the requirements of the Child Care and Early Years Act with regards to food and beverage provision. Section six of the practical guide talks about reading labels. Reading labels is very important. Refer to pages 27 to 31 to learn more about how to read a label and what to look for on the ingredient list. If you or your staff require more support in reading labels, there is a section on Health Canada's website or contact your local public health dietitian. And finally, section 7 of the guide discusses how to create a supportive nutrition environment. Table 10 provides some best practice guidelines such as 
have at least one adult eat with children during meals and snacks. Make sure child care providers talk with children at meal and snack times and encourage them to practice social and self-care skills. All the dining equipment, including utensils and dining furniture, are the appropriate size for children. Ensure that all distractions are removed during meal and snack time. And self-feeding, using a spoon, holding and drinking from an open cup, or eating finger foods appropriately, is encouraged and supported. Staff can role model healthy eating by eating the same food and beverages offered to children. Staff are to treat all children the same way regardless of their body size or shape. Avoid making judgments about the amount of food a child chooses to eat. And staff can refrain from using personal electronics, especially cell phones, during snack and meal times. Ensuring staff follow these guidelines will help to create a supportive food environment in your center which in turn will help children to create a positive relationship with food. This is a good place to remind everyone of the division of responsibility for feeding children, where adults are responsible for what, when, and where a child eats, and a child is responsible for how much or whether a food is eaten. Children may not finish what's on their plate, or they may ask for more. It is the adult's responsibility to provide nutritious food at set times throughout the day in a pleasant atmosphere. Staff should never force or pressure a child to eat or withhold food for any reason. This is part of creating a supportive food environment. If staff see a pattern of food refusal in a child, they should speak with the supervisor and involve the parent. Referral to another agency or medical professional may be in order. Staff education, training, and participation is crucial to creating a supportive nutrition environment. Use the other ODPH resources to learn more and to help plan your next set of menus. The Paint Your Plate Toolkit for child care providers has excellent recipes, sample menu plans, and food-related activities to use with children. Staff can complete the online learning modules as a group or individually and then come together to discuss what they've learned. And don't forget to complete the self-assessment tool. Call Public Health if further training or explanation is required. You will find menu templates on page 37 and 38 of this practical guide and a sample menu plan on page 39 just to get you started. Take it one section at a time and reach out with any questions. Public Health is here to support you in creating a nutritious menu and providing a supportive food environment, both of which will help to improve the quality of care at your centre.